Good afternoon. Welcome to an overview of the Chesapeake Bay program. This webinar will be tailored to our media partners, but is open to anyone that is interested in learning more about who the Chesapeake Bay program is and what it can offer. My name is Rachel Felber, and I am the communications director for the Chesapeake Bay program. I'll be giving this briefing today, but will be joined throughout the webinar by some of our other Bay program staff. The first person you'll meet is Jake Solist, our web content specialist for our flagship website, ChesapeakeBay.net. He'll be followed by Will Parson, our multimedia manager, who will provide an overview of our photos and videos. Before we dive into this presentation today, just a few housekeeping items. Everyone on this call has been muted and you will not be able to unmute. However, we want to hear your questions and comments. There is a Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen and I encourage you to use it throughout the presentation. We will answer questions in the order of which they are received. And if we don't have the answer for you right now, we'll take down your information so we can get back to you with it as soon as possible. We are recording this webinar today and you may access it through the link on the screen within the next 24 hours. If you experience any technical issues during the webinar that you think may be the fault of our system, please contact Marisa Baldin at mbaldine at chesapeakebay.net. So let's get started. What exactly is the Chesapeake Bay Program? We are a unique regional partnership consisting of federal and state agencies, local governments, academic institutions, non-governmental organizations, businesses, and individuals. Funding for our work comes primarily from the US Environmental Protection Agency and over two thirds of our annual budget goes directly back to the states and localities to fund on the ground restoration work that helps restore and protect the Chesapeake Bay. We provide solutions to sustain a thriving Chesapeake Bay watershed, fueled by science and driven by partnership. Our commitment to the Chesapeake Bay guides all of the work we do. The Chesapeake Bay is a crucial natural resource for us all. For everybody that lives, works, and plays within the watershed, not just those who reside on its shores. It is an economic engine and increases the health and well being of everybody in this region. Our work relies on rigorous science, quality assurance and control, policy, and management. This approach combined with world-class experts allows us to be responsible to the changing needs of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, including those of its people. This process is referred to as adaptive management and it is the backbone of everything the Chesapeake Bay program does. But our work could not be accomplished without our many partners across the watershed. We see ourselves as conveners bringing everyone involved in the Bay restoration process to the same table. Each and every one of our partners is critical to the overall health of the Chesapeake Bay, its surrounding rivers and streams, and its lands. Our partnership is led by the Chesapeake Executive Council, which consists of the governors of the six Chesapeake Bay watershed states, which are Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia, as well as the mayor of the District of Columbia, the chair of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, and the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency who represents the federal government. We refer to these folks as the signatories of the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement, and I'll get more into that in just a little bit. Additionally, representatives from non-governmental organizations, academic institutions, businesses, and local governments participate in one or more of our many work groups. The EPA maintains an office in Annapolis, Maryland, where their staff, grantees, contractors, and some select academic, federal, or state agency partners work. These are the people who are responsible for ensuring the day-to-day -day operations of the Chesapeake Bay program 
and are more commonly referred to as the Chesapeake Bay Program Office. With such a common name, I wanted to take a moment to clarify who we are not. We are not solely the Environmental Protection Agency. We receive a large portion of our funding from them, but they are just one voice in our decision-making process, along with the other members of the Chesapeake Executive Council. We are also not any of the organizations that have Chesapeake Bay in their title. We do not litigate, fundraise, or advocate, but I'm sure any of the organizations listed here would be more than happy to accept your donation. As I previously mentioned, members of our Chesapeake Executive Council are referred to as the signatory of our watershed agreement. The Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement governs the work of our partnership. We've had a few different watershed agreements at this point, but our most current was signed in 2014. It contains five themes, abundant life, clean water, climate change, conserved land, and engaged communities. Under these five themes, there are 10 goals and 31 outcomes. Each of these outcomes has a related work group that is dedicated to meeting its restoration target. For example, our oyster outcome seeks to restore native oyster habitat and populations in trend tributaries by 2025. Members of the work group that strive to meet this target come together from a variety of different organizations. Again, using the oyster outcome as an example, some of the organizations represented on this work group include the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, the City of Norfolk, Virginia, the Elizabeth River Project, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and Pleasure House Oysters, among many others. I want to specifically call out the water quality theme in the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. I'm going to assume that many of you on this call are familiar with, or at least have heard of, the Chesapeake Bay Total Maximum Daily Load. It is more commonly referred to by EPA as a pollution diet or by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation as the Clean Water Blueprint. It is a regulatory effort put into place by EPA to help restore the Chesapeake Bay. The Bay TMDL sets limits on the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment pollution that the six watershed states and the District of Columbia can release into the Chesapeake Bay and still have it meet standards for healthy water quality. The Bay TMDL was put into place in December of 2010 with the goal of having each of the six watershed states and the District of Columbia having all necessary practices in place to meet their pollution reduction targets by 2025. The targets vary for each of the states and DC and were calculated through state-of-the-art modeling tools, extensive monitoring data, peer-reviewed science, and interactions with each of the watershed states and DC. In crafting the watershed agreement, Partners wanted to include elements of the Bay TMDL to recognize its connection to the Bay Program. The two outcomes that are listed here, 2025 Watershed Implementation Plans and Water Quality Standards Attainment and Monitoring are the ways in which the Watershed Agreement integrates with the Bay TMDL. The 2025 Watershed Implementation Plans or WIPs considers modeling data in tracking progress while the water quality standards attainment and monitoring outcome is tracked using monitoring data. I mentioned tracking progress toward these two outcomes. So let's talk about how we do that and share this information in a public transparent manner. Welcome to Chesapeake Progress, a website designed to track our progress toward meeting the 31 outcomes of the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement and this is your one-stop shop for much of our data and information. Oops. Pardon me. Chesapeake Progress includes the most current data for all of our outcomes, which is collected from experts across the watershed ensuring accurate reporting of our progress. When you access progress as seen here, you will notice the five themes of the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement make up the navigation bar at the very top. 
Let's walk through an example. We'll use abundant life and then we'll see under that theme the goal of sustainable fisheries. We'll continue on with oysters. All of the, temp the pages for the different outcomes in Chesapeake Progress are gonna be the same layout. So you will see at the top of the page, the actual outcome language that's included in the watershed agreement, followed by the most up-to-date and current progress available for that outcome. We also are able to visualize that progress through charts and graphs that are interactive for folks to play around with. So if for instance, in oyster reef restoration, you are able to see what the acreage remaining to meet the target is, or simply the completed average. You also have the opportunity to download the raw data, the analysis and methods document that was used to calculate and explain the data, or you can even simply take a screenshot if you wish to use it in a presentation or an article. Some outcomes have a bit more information than others. So in the case of oysters, we also have an interactive map in which you can click on to see where some of the different restoration sites are throughout the watershed, as well as a progress dashboard that tells you the stage that each restoration or each site is currently in. And finally, each outcome also has a link to their associated management strategy, logic and action plan, which is a two-year plan that outlines the activities that the work group wants to meet to forward uh, toward the restoration target, as well as all the partners that participate in meeting that particular outcome. Every year, the Chesapeake Bay Program releases an annual report called the Bay Barometer, which is essentially a roundup of the most current data and information that is published on Chesapeake progress throughout the year. We are planning to release our 2019-2020 Bay Barometer on Wednesday, March 17th, so mark your calendars. We'll be having a media call and a webinar at that time, and we'll ensure that you all receive an invitation. In addition to the Bay Barometer, there are two other major assessments of Bay Health. The University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences Chesapeake Bay Report Card and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation State of the Bay Report. In all honesty, there is not a ton of difference between all of these reports, except for the period in which they report. The State of the Bay comes out every two years, typically in January. The Chesapeake Bay Report Card is an annual publication that comes out in the May and June timeframe. But the sources of data and information used to inform these reports typically come from some of the same sources. And we are happy to note that you can always find them first on Chesapeake Progress. So let's move away from the overview of the Bay Program now, discuss more about what we have to offer and why we are unique. We offer world-class scientific data and information, access to subject matter experts across a variety of environmental fields, shareable web content, articles and blogs, and photos and videos. Thanks to our experts and scientists, our partnership has pioneered cutting edge science and research. In the early 1990s, our researchers determined that airborne nitrogen was a significant con contributor to bay pollution. Our computer models are among the most sophisticated and studying across the entire world. Our Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative works with groups and individuals throughout the watershed to standardize data collected through community science efforts and makes it publicly available. Our Chesapeake Bay Watershed Data Dashboard is an online tool that provides accessibility and visualization of data and technical information that helps guide water quality and planning efforts. And finally, the link here at the bottom of this page will take you to our flagship website where you can find lists of all the other data and data sets that is available. We offer access to some of the world's leading experts in a variety of environmental disciplines. 
This is just a sampling of some of them. For instance, our expert in agriculture, Kelly Shank, is a nutrient coordinator with the Environmental Protection Agency. Our expert in oysters is Stephanie Westby, who is a restoration pro program director at NOAA. I also want to give a plug that if you can't find exactly what you're looking for or have a more unique interest in research, for the Chesapeake Bay Expertise Database. This is a product of the Chesapeake Research Consortium, and it allows experts and scientists and professors from across the watershed to sign up on a voluntary basis, and you can search through any of their research areas to find out the best person to contact. We also offer a plethora of original content for the web and in the forms of articles and blogs. I'm now gonna turn this over to Jake Solist, who will walk us through our flagship website, chesapeakebay.net. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you for everyone who's joining us today on the call. My name is Jake Solist. I'm the web content specialist at the Chesapeake Bay program. And I'm gonna walk you through some different pages and resources on our website, chesapeakebay.net. So starting with the um, top uh, blue bar navigation there, we're gonna start all the way to the left with discover the Chesapeake. So this section is essentially where you can get a baseline understanding of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We have a history page about people and events um, that happened in the region a field guide section where we have um, identified over 250 animals and plant species. Uh, we have a page about the Bay's ecosystem and various other educational pages and sections. Next, we have our learn the issues page. Here you can learn about the, how things like agriculture, invasive species, climate change, um, affect the watershed specifically. We detail these issues on the page and we also provide at the end information about what individuals can do to um, help reduce the effects of these issues. To the side of the page, we also have a FAQ section that relates to the specific issue. And the FAQ section is a, another part of our website that people can use to send in questions that our communications team will respond to. The next section is State of the Chesapeake. So this, con this uh, section contains similar information to what was on Chesapeake Progress, but focuses specifically on um, some of our environmental threats like habitats and wildlife, using a lot of graphics and visuals to, to give a snap snapshot of, of these issues. It also includes data that's not tracked on Chesapeake progress, but still is important to understanding the health of the bay and uh, is interesting to the public. This includes pages about dead zone, bald eagle, and population. Next is our take action section. Here people can get resources and information they need in order to play their part in restoring the bay. We have a how to and tips page that lists different environmentally friendly actions. We have a find the group page, which allows you to enter in your zip code and find watershed groups that are in your area. We also have an attend the events calendar that lists public friendly events, such as educational webinars and volunteer events. And finally, we have a visit the Chesapeake page, which allows you to find nearby public access sites for fishing, swimming, boating, etc. And last in that section, we have our newsletter section, which shows three different newsletters we have. They're sent out daily, weekly, and monthly. Next, we have our in the news section. The press center is where you can, or where we are posting press releases. And then recent news is our blog. We write about 10 new blogs a month, covering stories about wildlife, restoration projects, outdoor recreation, bay history, and various other unique people, places, things happening in the watershed. 
These articles are available for reprint in your publication, so please get in contact with us if you're interested in using them. Also, if you have a story idea that you think would make for a good article on our website, we would love to hear about that. The next section is who we are. Here we can find information about our staff, our partners, how we're organized, our history, an overview of our budget financing programs, job openings, and contact information. And then lastly, we have the section, what we do, which has various pages about the work of the Chesapeake Bay program, includes pages about programs and projects, grants and RFPs that are available, a meetings calendar that shows all Bay program meetings that are happening, and a publications data maps page, which has a ton of available resources provided by our scientists. Now I'm gonna pass it over to our multimedia manager, Will Parson. Thank you, Jake, and uh, hello everyone. Um, I, like Jake said, uh, my name is Will Parson. I'm the multimedia manager for the Chesapeake Bay program. And we present a range of documentary visual storytelling featuring the people and places that make up the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Usually our photography and video uh, is first produced as part of those, those feature articles that Jake was just mentioning on chesapeakebay.net. Um, and actually all the photos you've seen in this pre presentation and the photos you will see are, are from our archive. Uh, like our other content, uh, as Jake described, we freely share our photo and video archives for non-commercial or media use. Uh, basically, most educational or editorial uses would qualify. Uh, the organizations and outlets who make use of our archive seem to appreciate that we travel extensively throughout the watershed in order to bring back original content. Uh, it's something that not many publications are able to do, unfortunately. Uh, every orange dot on this map represents a set of photos that is in our, our public facing photo archive. Uh, so I've been to you know, every state and jurisdiction in the watershed over the, the past several years. Uh, to date, we have over 14,000 photographs available through our archive, which uh, you can search on Flickr. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a few slides, we'll have some web addresses uh, and you'll see where you can access our, that photo archive. Uh, as I was saying, we, we take a documentary approach to telling stories from across the Chesapeake Bay watershed to try to show how watershed restoration relates to people's everyday lives and well-being. Our approach also follows the code of ethics established by the National Press Photographers Association. So we, we follow situations as they unfold without staging things or, or creating photo, auto, photo ops, just real moments. If you scan our archive, you'll see uh, that we focus predominantly on people in relation to their environment, uh, involving not only the people doing the work of restoration, uh, but the people who stand to benefit from more livable uh, environments. We offer a range of subjects, including uh, agriculture, as you see here. Uh, we, we visit a lot of parks and do a lot of wildlife photography. Uh, we cover the range of restoration efforts, everything from forest buffers to rain gardens to cover crops to green infrastructure. Uh, we have a fair amount of aerial photography uh, produced in a great partnership we have with the nonprofit South Wings, who's taken us on uh, multiple flights uh, across the watershed. So we've got some good aerial coverage. Our videos include our flagship series, Bay 101, which is uh, a series of introductory uh, videos describing different environmental issues and topics like oysters, blue crabs, uh, uh, all the way to population growth. Um, we also produce feature stories that show a more personal perspective. Uh, our, our videos are embeddable uh, on, on your own pages, um, but you can also request raw footage uh, to be used in your own video products, and we, we do that a, a lot. Uh, we have covered everything from watermen to wild, wildlife, uh, both on, on land and uh, underwater. Make good use of that GoPro. Uh, this is this uh, article you see is uh, uh, a portion of a recent Bay Journal article uh, at the bottom uh, about mitigating flood risks where our video is embedded in that story. Um, and uh, at the top, you see just one recent example of our photo archive uh, in action. It, it was uh, published as a cover story for Maryland Sea Grant's most recent issue of Chesapeake Quarterly. Uh, 
uh, I made this series of photographs showing microplastics collected during scientific surveys of the Chesapeake Bay, the Chesapeake watershed. Um, and those, those photos in one form or another have gotten republished uh, probably more than anything we've put out. Um, if, if you have a request in mind, feel free to send a quick note to me at wparson at chesapeakebay.net. Uh, even if you haven't found the photo you're looking for in our archive, I might be able to help you find it, even if it's not online. And uh, as promised, you can find our photo archive by following the link to Flickr seen here. Um, and the, the final link here um, will give you more information on how to make a request, uh, again, by sending me an email. Uh, wparson at chesapeakebay.net. Uh, basically, we ask for contact information and uh, some basic information about how the, the photo or the video footage will be used. Uh, so th with that, that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, if you think we can help you help supplement your, your own reporting, uh, your own coverage, I, I look forward to hearing from you. Now I'd like to just share with you some additional resources that we have to offer. The first is Bay Backpack. Bay Backpack provides educators with information about funding opportunities, curriculum, lesson plans, and other guides related to environmental education. The next is the Chesapeake Tree Canopy Network. This will connect you with resources, stories, and best practices to better expand and maintain the tree canopy in your area. The Chesapeake Riparian Forest Buffer Network helps to connect you with information around planting forest buffers throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. It also contains resources and stories. Now we have Wetlands Work, which is geared toward agricultural landowners who are looking to restore wetlands on their lands. As I mentioned earlier, this is our website for our Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative, as well as our Chesapeake Bay Watershed Data Dashboard. And finally, the Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool, better known as CAST. CAST is geared toward more technical audiences, including planners that are looking to figure out the best conservation practices that would give them the most pollutant reductions while saving them money. And don't forget to engage with us on our social media channels. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and we look forward to hearing from you at any time. Before we end for the day, I wanted to share one of the videos that our multimedia media manager, Will Parson, put together going through our partnership in more detail. I hope you enjoy it. It begins in New York, but also Virginia and Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Delaware, and DC. The Chesapeake Bay watershed spans 64,000 square miles. This is the area of land where rain or snow ultimately flows to the Chesapeake. Everybody is in a watershed. The stream that goes through your neighborhood, you can see how it's connected to the bay. Whatever starts way up there and comes down here ends up going down to the bay. The Susquehanna River, for example, travels hundreds of miles through cities and farmland, and pollution in one place is carried downstream. The unity of the whole thing, there is no such thing as just a part of the bay. What happens in every part of the bay affects every other part. Well, I can remember when uh, Chesapeake Bay was uh, relatively clear water. Now all of that really has changed. I think we have Mac Mathias to thank because he was one of the early people that said we got to do something about this body of water. The, the oyster cake is down dramatically from what it was at the beginning of the century. Uh, fish are harder to find. Things were not looking very good in the 1960s and 70s. That's when our aquatic grasses just crashed. That's when that water clarity really started to get bad. Oysters, blue crabs, striped bass, brook trout, hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, kayaking, canoeing. All of those things are really important to both the economy and the recreation in the area. 
we've got species diversity, of course, but we've got tons of diversity of people. I first experienced the Chesapeake Bay from a work boat. On another level, it's this place where my kids can go and my members can go and find a level of peace. I've grown up on this land. I followed my dad all around on it. I'm a fourth generation farmer. You know, I like to fish and crab and I want it to be there for my kids and my grandchildren. The Chesapeake Bay and the tributaries is not just a way to make a living. It, it's a tradition, it's a way of life. It's kind of in your blood. The oysters act as a filter to clean the water. So the more oysters come back, the better the water quality will be. In 1975, at the urging of Senator Mathias, Congress funded a five-year study of the Bay's failing health coordinated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. In 1983, the Chesapeake Bay Commission sponsored a conference at George Mason University. And that was the point at which the governor signed the first Bay Agreement. That was the beginning of the Chesapeake Bay program. The 82 Agreement was not even a page in length, and they were just trying to understand what's wrong with the Chesapeake. We did all kinds of outreach for the Bay program to explain in lay language what was going on with the Bay and get, get feedback on proposed actions. The Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay also made sure that there was a citizen monitoring effort very early on so that citizens could get involved not only in how they can help restore the Bay but also in monitoring the success. As the Bay agreements have evolved over time they've gotten more comprehensive in terms of trying to capture what are all the different activities us humans carry out on the land that could influence local waters and influence the Chesapeake? This great partnership of so many different federal agencies, state agencies and governments, as well as community foundations and nonprofit organizations, all work together to understand better what's happening in the Chesapeake Bay so that we can make the decisions that will actually help improve the Bay's health. So all the monitoring we do is coordinated through the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership. We use the monitoring data, one, to improve models that we have to simulate conditions in the bay and its watershed. And those models are used to help say, where do we need to reduce nutrients coming into the bay and by how much to improve conditions for fish. We also then use the monitoring to try to focus where we want to put the restoration efforts. And then finally, we, we use it over time to say, is the bay and its watershed getting better as we put all these efforts in to reduce pollution? As we went into the 2014 Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement, the ask to put goals in there, to put objectives, leaving flexibility about how we got there. We do things more than just water quality. It's about really ecosystem management. We also understood that to be successful, we needed a more diverse group of partners, a more diverse group of leaders that reflected the cultures that we have across the Chesapeake itself. To have these states come together in the Bay watershed, it's the only way we're going to keep the Bay alive and productive for a long time. Finally, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. I would love to try to answer any questions that you may have. My contact information is listed here, and I can be reached at rfelver at chesapeakebay.net. I also am including here the contact information for my colleague, Roy Seneca, who is happy to answer any questions you may have if they're about the Bay TMDL or any funding for the Chesapeake Bay Program. Thank you all for attending today. I hope you've learned something new, and we hope to hear from you soon.